Welcome to Battleship Cove and our Inside the History series. Here we are in the projectile flat, the projectile deck on turret number two with USS Wisconsin veteran and gunner's mate Thomas Lowney. Tom Lowney, as you remember from our other video, uh, knows a lot about these gun turrets. He was a number one gun in Wisconsin and also has been a volunteer on Big Mamie and is our primary gun, gunner's mate um, and knows a lot about the assistance. So Tom, can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here on Big Mamie right now in turret two? All right, thank you, Rich. You're inside the lower projectile deck inside of turret two. You have your storage for your projectiles. They stand position on flat deck. You have your fixed storage here on the outside of the turret and then the rotating ring on the inside here this rotating ring holds about 72 rounds. This is where you're fixed. You don't have fixed ammunition on these ships. You have semi-fixed. You have uh, powder, which is down the magazines, and you have your projectile. This is your explosive charge. This is what goes through when you fire to your target. And to get that up here, we store these in an upright position because it's easier to move. So you can move these projectiles around. But these projectiles, as you see here, this is the Mark 141, basically a Mark 13 body in the World War II style. These are modified afterwards. But these projectiles weigh about 1,900 pounds. They're for high explosive, high capacity, and numerous other uh, types of projectiles. With that, these are your, your sure bombardment and your light armor penetration. Okay, 1,900 pounds compared to the armor piercing. Now, the armor piercing is you have two different types there. You have the Mark V and the Mark VIII. The Mark V was originally what was carried on board Massachusetts starting in the Battle of Casablanca. That's all she had. The uh, Mark 13 didn't come out until midway through the war when she went to the Pacific. The armor piercing on board here, the Mark V was 2,240 pounds. That didn't have the super weight that added it and made it 2,700. That Mark 8 projectile came out later as well with the high capacity mainly for the Iowas, but they were able to be fired out of this ship. And normally the Navy just shifted right over and changed all that. So the, the Mark Vs were worked out of the system and were replaced with the 2700 as a standard. That was for the Iowas, South Dakotas, but not the Colorados. Colorados had to stick with the Mark Vs and um, they had to go, they were able to use the Mark 13s because they were short of base because the Colorados have a lower uh, storage area. So as you can see in here, we have the outer fixed storage and the inner ring, all right? Now these here operate independently, the uh, inner rings. The inner rings move via a gear system with an A and B, um, not A and B, and a geared A and B and set up inside the center of the gun. So this ring can operate independent of both the center of the gun. Because this here, if you see right from here, this is the rotating part of the turret right here, from here in. So this platform deck that we're actually standing on right now, I'm on the stationary position. Correct. But you're standing on a rotating section that moves with the turret. What Correct. Describe, this, and that also turns? And this also turns separately, so that way you can feed the powder, or the uh, projectile hoist. You have left gun, center gun, right gun. So as you, when you're in here, you have to keep yourself oriented to where you are. And it's very difficult because you notice there's no sign saying fore, aft, port, starboard. Right. You have to keep cognizant of where you're at and the ship because your hoists are your primary feed. So to feed them, you have to feed from the inner ring. The inner ring carries 72 projectiles. The outer ring carries 130. All right. So you have to be able to get those to here and those into there. You can't do all that at once. So what happens, Rich, is that when you use up the inner rings, because if you're able to use a, a lever that allows you to go left and right, to bring your projectiles over. And you would use par buckling gear to take the projectile from the inner ring into the individual hoist. So is there par buckling gear anywhere near us right now? We're, we're standing right here, right next to this piece of equipment right here. It looks like a capstan. It does look like a, a line handling capstan on the outside of the ship. Very similar, but this is a gypsy head. 
what it has is a slip clutch inside of it. So that way it spins, and as you tighten out the rope after a few turns, wrapped around the projectile base and hooked to a point, so that way you could come around a pulley, which that, see this little wheel here? If you were to drag this out inside, say this projectile was in the hoist, you'd come from a hook, you'd wrap around the projectile, uh, excuse me, hook, wrap around that, come around into the gypsy head. You'd keep a few turns on it, so that way, three or four turns, that way when you tighten the line, the slip clutch grabs. It's just like a clutch in a car. It grabs it, and now you get taut, and you're using the clutch grabs it and pulls it in. So that way you can manhandle the speed and how far you want to move it. Now it takes three people to do that. The three people, one is to operate the gypsy head in the line. The other two are to guide the projectile. Got to remember, you're talking a ton of fun here. This thing has to go from one surface to the next surface to the next surface. So in order to do that, as you see, the deck is painted, Rich. This deck would normally not be painted. It'd be a very fine oil film on it. Not something enough to go flying in the air and slip, but enough so that way, steel to steel, these will slide on their bases and be brought into here or from here into there. So this particular track, I'm going to call mm -hmm. it track for lack of a better term that you use, track feeds the hoist mechanism itself. And right. You would actually move these shells from the stationary position into this position to Correct. keep loading. Correct. And you would do that only during a downtime because you got to remember the turret is actually operating. You don't want to go to a fixed structure in the middle of combat and tie up par buckling gear and dragging projectiles out. What would happen is you would eat up your inner rings. You have two. You have the upper and lower. So the upper and lower feed the hoist. Once this gets depleted, what normally would happen in a lull in battle when you don't have a target to shoot at or you have a downtime, okay, paw buckling teams, get ready. Turret, turret one, turret two, whatever turret you're in, they'll call you to center line. Stand by, stand by. You request permission to load the center ring from the outer ring. So here's a and good then you would just paw buckle all that stuff. Your teams would pull it all in and pull it in. A question for you is, we talked about moving the ammunition inside the projectile flat, mm -hmm. but where does the ammunition come from and how do you get it into the projectile flat? To begin with, well that would be your initial onload. When you do an onload ammunition, you have to pre-designate what you want to load the ship up. Are you going to do ship-to-ship uh, -ship contact? Are you going to do sure bombardment? Are you going to do a mix of it? So what you would do is you have a pre-plan. You pre-plan all your ammunition and your powder bags and so forth. Well, right now we're worried about projectiles. Now the projectiles will come on deck, usually two to a pallet, or sometimes just one to one, depending on what time frame and how storage. Because over time it was developed on how to move ammunition. Usually they, they'd use a projectile sling. We don't have one hanging here. We have one down below. We'll show later. Your sling would take that projectile, clamp on it. You'd be able to lift it via chain fall, and then you'd move it where you needed to on a monorail system or you'd use a davit system. You'd get it with pallets to your loading area, which would be your trunks next to the turrets, and then you'd use a davit with a power hoist. You'd put the projectile sling on it, lock it in place, you'd lift the projectile up, then you'd pull a pin, which would take it from a horizontal to a vertical position, and then you'd lower it down through the trunks, down all the way to the base of the turret. That's your powder flat and annular space. The annular space is the outer ring to the turret. It divides the magazines to the powder flats. In there you have also other parts of the turret we'll get into later. Sprinkler systems, charging flasks, that all part of the gun system. But these hoist areas are able to bring up the projectiles. Behind over here we have one of the hoists that bring it up from the annular space up to the shell deck, or in this case being turret 2, you'd bring it up to the mezzanine and then you would move it all the way up to here. To the fixed storage, you'd pull it out from the hoist area, you drop the projectile, there'll be little notches that the toe that holds up the projectile, because it has two claws that come around that move about 15 degrees, so that way you can latch around it, secure a pin, and then there's a toe underneath that holds the base of it. Once it picks it up, the weight is on the base and the cradle around it. So that way when you pull it up and then you pull the pin, it has an eye that you attach to, you can push it and sling it down. So 
So this is a really manual, labor-intensive Intense. That you, takes a long time to do to load out a battleship. Two, two to four, four days more of work to fully unload That's a, a long ship. Time, folks. And, and we can see why in the Battle of Casablanca, it was getting them to, they, they had to set time away and have to turn away from the shoreline because turret two, you, as you just stated, had a mezzanine deck that had extra ammunition in it right. that they needed to get out to the other projectile planes. Right. Because uh, that had to be brought down to the, to the annuals, out to the trunk, up on deck, and then out and then down to the other turrets, or you could use Broadway. So, and it's so another way to do that, but that's, that's something else for so a later time. So this projectile flat, as you're describing, is a storage area for ammunition that's being ready to the hoist to right. go into the gun system. This would be your ready service ammunition, Excellent. and only source of ammunition for projectiles. Could you show us a hoist for this video? Sure. If we could take a look at the hoist. Right. Here we have our hoist right behind me. Now this hoist... If you come around here, you can see we have a, a Mark 13 painted up like an armor piercing. Now, uh, this is how the projectile would sit in the hoist. Now, here's, since we're on the lower flat, you'd have five projectiles to reach all the way up to the gun room. Now, each of these projectile hoists are different because of their proximity in the ship and how they have to come up to the back of the guns because the guns are all centered on trunnions, but as you see, it's a round circle. So these hoists, some of them go straight up, like center. These others curl out to reach proper position so they can get up into the gun rooms and into the cradles. Once in the cradles, Rich, it comes out, it, it, it spans out in the spanning tray, and the rammer is used to put it in. We'll cover that later when we go to the gun rooms. But right here is your hoist. Now these hoists have doors spring-loaded, so that way a projectile can be pulled in using the parbuckling gear which would be done out here and around to the gypsy head. That allows for the projectile to be pulled in from the ring here into here. And then you would go and you line these up one hoist at a time. Normally, you're offset a little bit, but you can do the par buckling. So when you load up, if you've got a good crew, you've got three par buckling kings pulling from the inner ring to the hoist set to go. Now, the operator who runs the hoist here now, this is the fun part, because the way this hoist works, they don't go up individually. They have uh, what's uh, basically a rack and pinion setup that one piston comes up and takes the weight of all the projectiles on a powell. The powell retracts, it's spring-loaded so it pops out. And it's also curved, so when a projectile comes up behind it, it pushes that powell out of the way, because it's also grabbing the next... They're in sync together, so when they pick up, they pick all at once, it goes to a full extension, and the other piles on the fixed side of the structure fall out and grab it. So when it goes to its full extension, it comes back down, it rests on the outer piles. Those piles, as a piston returns its stroke, comes all the way down, passes the next projectile in line, gets pushed in. When it passes that next set, it flips out. So you're doing a ratcheting action. And these projectiles move up, move up, move up, and that's how they operate. So when you've got to change ammunition, it's a pain because you have to preset what you're going to be doing. If you're going to ship to ship, it's armor piercing or who, however the gunnery officer wants to do it. If he wants to do a high capacity for ranging to save his armor piercing or a BLMP, blank loaded and plug. These are Mark 13 bodies. It's called the, this particular modification of it is the Mark 141. All right. You could use these for training as well as for ranging. So that way you don't waste valuable uh, ammunition, high explosives on just trying to range. But again, depends on how your training doctrine is for each ship. It's different and how you do your firing in combat. So you'd preset your hoist for what you wanted. If you had to clear everything, I say I had all armor piercing and you wanted to switch over to shore bombardment, now you've got to pull all five out because each one of these projectiles is part of the design flame seal. Okay, if there was a fire or something above, these projectiles would block the hoist to prevent major flow of air and fire down and pressure through. Actuality doesn't work too great, but it slows down any advances of any fire, smoke, or anything. Instead of a big hole, you have a plug, the projectile. So these projectiles would have to be pulled back out. The dogs would have to come out of the sides. You have to manually open the door, drag them back out, put them in the rack, send them over, move the next one in. So it becomes a complicated effort because every time when you move this handle, all right, 
pins tight. It hasn't done in a long time. But anyway, it has raised and lower. So you've got to bring it all the way over, and the piston goes all the way up. Grabs the projectile, lifts it off the other pile, and it can be, it's, when you go to lower, you're switching over. On the top of the stroke, when it picks the projectiles up, the power will be retracted hydraulically. The projectile can be brought down. Because when you switch over from lower to raise, you're changing the hydraulic assist on the piles because the piles have to be retracted to let the projectiles come back down. But if you're in hoist mode, you don't want it to come back down. You want the pile to stay there unless pushed out of the way. So you have a lot of hydraulics going on with these pistons to raise the projectiles through, and they're five in a row. So you're set for five rounds ready to go if these hoists are all manned constantly. And like I said, you have to pre-plan all your ammunition outreach and how you want to shoot your battle. So Tom, thank you very much once again. Tom Vlaunie, Gunner's Mate, USS Wisconsin, turret number one. Uh, permanent lifetime Gunner's Mate, USS Massachusetts has been a long time with you. Your uh, videos and your, and your information that you have is excellent. We're proud to have you on our team and part of our Balashko family. Uh, thank you for watching our video, America's uh, Fleet Museum, Battleship Cove. We're proud to present this information that many of our volunteers and experts have and many of our veterans. Uh, once again, we're on USS Massachusetts. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, comment, follow us on social media, follow us on Instagram, uh, donate, volunteer. Uh, these ships are here for you. These ships belong to you. Uh, we're trying to uh, present them to you so you can learn a little bit of history behind the scenes, and that's why we call this Inside the History Series. So thanks for watching, and please come back again. We'll see you next time.